Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with a video. Today's one is all about the required practicals on paper one. And required practicals are so important nowadays because of the fact that they make up 15% of your paper. And you might be wondering, why do these required practicals? Well, it's the exam board's uh, way of testing your skills, making sure that you can identify variables, making sure you can analyse risks, and that you can evaluate procedures. So during this video, I'm going to go through the practicals and hopefully we can look at some of them skills when we encounter these practicals. Remember, if you do like the video, please drop it a like and subscribe to the channel. Before we get started looking at the practicals, we're going to look at a few key terms that we need to know before being able to look at practicals. The first definitions we're going to look at are for the variables. These are the things that in the practical we're either changing, measuring or controlling. So let's look at the first one, which is the independent variable. This is what you change in a practical. And there's also a couple of rules that you can help uh, remember which one usually is the independent variable. They go on the x-axis of graphs and usually they are in the left-hand side column in a table. We also have uh, the dependent variable, which is what we measure in an experiment, and that goes on the y-axis in a graph. And we also have our control variables, which is what we keep the same in an experiment. Another key term we need to know about is hypothesis, which is a prediction for the practical. It's how you think that practical is going to go. When we're looking at analysing a practical, there are even more terms that we need to know about. The first one we're going to look at is reliability. The first one we're going to look at is reliability. Your results can be said to be reliable if you take lots of results and take lots of repeats of your results and you keep getting the same answer. Another word that uh, is sometimes used to describe results is repeatable. And this means that if someone else did the practical, they get the same result. Results can also be described as being accurate or precise. If your results are accurate, this means they are close or uh, on the true value. If your results are precise, this means that you keep getting the same result. When evaluating a practical, you also look at the errors that that practical might have. And you can categorize the errors. For example, you can have systematic errors where you keep repeating the same mistake. And this results in all of your results being essentially wrong. You can have an instrumental error. which is obviously where your equipment is responsible for the error. Or you can also get human errors, which is just where you basically either you spill something or you don't read an instrument correctly. So it's as a result of human action that you get the wrong result. So without further ado, let's get started actually looking at some of these practicals. Whilst I'm going through, please start to think about what is the independent variables, dependent variables and control variables, as I might not have time in each one of the practicals to go through these. The first practical we're going to look at is how to use a light microscope. And we looked at animal cells and plant cells using this light microscope. The first step you should stay, take whilst uh, preparing a microscope slide is by putting your actual sample onto the slide. The next step is you add an indicator solution which helps you see the sample underneath. Now, uh, you might have seen that when you did this for a plant and animal cell, you used different uh, indicators. For example, with a plant, you probably used iodine and with the animal cheek cell you probably use methylene blue. Then what you'll have done is slowly uh, lower the cover slip and you probably 
uh, use forceps. The reason why I use forceps here is because of the fact that the forceps uh, mean you do not get air bubbles. Air bubbles is the way you can make a mistake with this practical. If you let air into your slide, you will see the air bubble underneath the microscope rather than the sample you're actually trying to look at. Also, you always start on low power to make sure that you aren't over magnifying at the start so you can actually start to see your sample and you use uh, the coarse adjuster uh, to get focused onto uh, the cell that you're trying to look at. Often this question accompanies a question on how magnified that sample is or how big the actual sample that you're looking at is. Uh, so that goes back to the magnification triangle uh, and realizing that the magnification equals the image size divided by the actual size. So you can work out your actual size of your sample uh, by doing the image size divided by the magnification. And that is the first required practical done. On to the second biology required practical now. The second required practical you look at in biology is the osmosis required practical. And in this practical you can observe osmosis by placing a potato chip inside three. One of the solutions is pure water which is called the hypotonic solution. One of them is the half concentration sugar or salt solution which is the isotonic solution and the last one is a hypertonic solution which is a strong salt or sugar solution. So in this practical my independent variable the thing that I'm changing in each of the practical is the concentration of salt solution and what I'm trying to measure my dependent variable is the percentage change by mass of the potato chips. Now it's important to remember this doesn't have to be potato, it could be another vegetable uh, or it could be a piece of agar jelly, it doesn't matter. Don't be thrown on what they put in the solution. That's a key thing to remember with all of these required practicals is sometimes the examiners modify or change them a little bit to try and throw them. So don't be tricked by the examiner if they put in a different solution to what you've seen before but you still recognize the practical. Now the control variables for this practical is probably what they're going to ask you about. So the control variables in this practical you need to keep the same is you need to keep the length of the chip the same or the surface area of the chip the same. The reason for this is because of the fact if it has a larger surface area it's going to lose or gain mass more easily. Also, you need to control the length of time that it stays inside the solution. Because, of course, you're going to see a bigger percentage change if it's been in that solution for longer. Also, you may encounter a couple of different types of errors in this practical. For example, some people don't forget to dry the potato before weighing. So, um... If you didn't do that for all of the potatoes, this would be a systematic error. So you'd have a problem with all your results. Obviously, what you should observe in this practical is that in the hypotonic solution, the mass increases because the water is going to move into the potato chip using osmosis. In the isotonic, you shouldn't observe a noticeable change because of the um, concentration of sugar and water is the same as inside uh, of the potato so the mass should stay around the same and then in the hypertonic solution what you should notice is the mass of the potato chips. So what you will see in this practical is that you can get a positive or negative percentage change of mass. The next practical you look at involves enzymes and how enzymes work to break down usually uh, this practical involves the breakdown of starch using the enzyme analase. However don't be thrown if they do change the food test. You know all the food tests uh, from B3 the digestive system uh, so they might change the food test and you might need a different enzyme to use. 
But what this practical involves is basically changing the pH uh, and observing how long it takes for that enzyme to act. So what you're going to measure will be the time taken for amylase to break down starch. Now to detect um, that starch is present, what you use is you use a iodine solution. So the first job you do is spotting each um, tray on the spotting rack with one drop or two drops of iodine. Now if starch is present, what you observe is you observe the colour change of yellow to black. And once the amylase has broken down all of that starch, because what happens when starch breaks down is it turns into glucose. So what happens when all that starch is broken down to glucose is you do not observe this yellow to black anymore, okay? And there'll just be iodine in that spotting tray with the yellow colour. So in this practical, uh, it's key to remember to control how much of each pH buffer solution you use, as well as how much amylase and starch In the topic of B3 uh, organization in the digestive system, the required practical is to do food tests. One of my favorite practicals to do of all time. And in this practical, all we do is we test for different nutrients. The nutrients that we test for are protein, sugars, starch, and lipids. The test for protein is dead, dead easy. All you do is you add a solution of burette, it's called, uh, which is a mixture of copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide. And if protein is present, it goes to a purple solution. Burette on its own is usually quite a light blue color. The next one is testing for sugars, in which you use a solution of Benedict. And this one also requires a bit of heat as well. So you usually use a water bath. You add the Benedict solution and then place it in a water bath. Now you can get quite a few different observations for if uh, sugar is present. If there is a load of sugar, it will go deep red. And this means that the sugar content is very high. Uh, if it goes a yellow, it is kind of 50-50. Uh, and if it stays blue green uh, it's low in sugar starch is tested using iodine and if starch is present you see it goes black a nice easy one lipids that's also a nice one as well you add ethanol and you add water and if there is lipids present it goes cloudy the last biology required practical looks at the limiting factors affecting photosynthesis. Uh, in this practical, what you probably did was you measured the distance between a light source and pondweed suspended in water, which had some sodium hydrogen carbonate solution inside. The reason why you added sodium hydrogen carbonate was because this was a source of CO2 and obviously CO2 is needed for photosynthesis. However, we weren't able to control the temperature, which is the other factor that can affect photosynthesis. So that is something that you could look at. Uh, maybe if you were to improve this investigation, you could control the temperature by placing this in a water bath or something like that. But anyway, in this practical, what you change is the distance from the light source that the pondweed is at. And this changes the light intensity. And there's a little rule for remembering uh, the light intensity, and that is the light intensity is proportional to one over D squared. How we measured the rate of photosynthesis for this practical was really cool though. 
uh, we counted up the amount of bubbles and that told us the rate of photosynthesis which was the amount of bubbles. The reason why you can do this is because of the fact when plants photosynthesize they produce oxygen and the oxygen bubbles show how quickly it is photosynthesizing. What you should observe with this practical is that when you increase the distance the rate of photosynthesis should increase. What you should observe is as the distance decreases to the pondweed that the rate of photosynthesis increases because the light intensity is increasing. And if you were to draw a graph of light intensity uh, against the number of bubbles or rate of photosynthesis like we call it, uh, what you should observe is you get a curve like this. Now the reason why you get a curve like this is because when you get to this point here and this light intensity, light intensity now is a limiting factor. That means that something else um, is limiting the rate of the photosynthesis. That could be temperature, that could be uh, the amount of CO2, but no more photosynthesis can occur past this light intensity. And that is all of the biology required practicals. Now we are on to chemistry and you don't encounter your first chemistry required practical until quite a way through the course and it's during the topic of chemical changes and the first required practical is looking at how to make pure dry salt. The first step in this procedure is determining what reactants you're going to use. Now, if you're making a chloride salt, obviously you're going to use hydrochloric acid. If you're making a sulfuric, uh, a sulfate salt, for example, you would use sulfuric acid. Um, and the metal, usually you, you will use the metal oxide, uh, which is insoluble. So once you've reacted the metal oxide with your acid, what you need to do is you need to filter the unreacted metal oxide. The reason why uh, you have to filter unreacted metal out is because you've added it in excess. This means that all the sulfuric acid has reacted. When you react a metal oxide with an acid, what you make is you make the salt and you also make some water. Now, Currently, what we have here is we have our salt solution. But we need to get rid of some of that water. So what we do is we evaporate uh, a lot of that water off by heating with a Bunsen burner. Then what you need to do is you need to uh, not evaporate all the water off or else you'll lose some of your salt. So you dry on a windowsill. And usually these questions are method questions. So what you'd need to do is just regurgitate that method and the main marks will come from you being able to decide the reagents you're going to use for that practical and just recite the technique. So then four key steps. The next required practical is electrolysis of molten and uh, solutions. Now, if you've got a molten electrolysis, it's really easy to uh, work out your products as you will always just make what is inside your electrolyte. So say, for example, if you have molten NaCl, you have the ions Na plus and Cl minus in your electrolyte. And with electrolysis, when you get these, you need to remember not to panic, which means positive anode negative is cathode these are the two electrodes so you know that the sodium ions are going to go to the negative electrode because of opposites attract and this is called the cathode and my negative ion is going to go to my positive electrode which is called the anode so for molten solutions it's dead dead easy however it's a little bit more tricky when you have uh, solutions because you're introducing OH minus ions and also H plus ions. So you need to decide what's going to be made. You can either make oxygen or hydrogen 
at the anode and cathode respectively. So the anode which attracts the negative ions, uh, if your negative ions are halogens then a halogen is made. So you could make chlorine, fluorine, bromine or iodine at the anode. However, if negative ions are not halogens, you always make oxygen. And that's just a rule that you need to remember. Now, if positive ions are less reactive than hydrogen, that is what you make. So for unreactive metals, such as copper, uh, maybe gold, silver, all of that good stuff, uh, they are so unreactive, they will always be made at the cathode. However, if you have a really reactive metal uh, and you've got that in solution, what you always make is hydrogen. So for example, say if your metal is potassium, sodium, lithium, zinc, you are working with two reactive of a metal and you will make hydrogen. You don't need to know why, you just need to remember that rule. The last required practical in this topic looks at energy changes. So whether the temperature of a solution goes up or down and determining whether you have an exothermic or endothermic solution. If the temperature goes up, you have an exothermic solution. And I always remember that as heat is exiting, so the temperature goes up. And if you have an endothermic solution, your temperature goes down. With the required practical, the independent variable, what you change in the practical, you're always changing your reagents. So you might change what metal you're adding to see what the temperature change difference will be, um, or you might be changing the acid. It's just gonna be the changing what you're adding. The dependent variable is going to be the temperature change, and the important thing, looking at control variables in this practical is the main thing I think they will ask you about. So to control this practical, you need to make sure that heat cannot escape your reaction or get into it. So this practical setup here is not very good, for example. You would probably want a beaker or um, something that you could, a lid to put on your beaker uh, in order so that heat cannot escape. Also, you're going to control the amount of time that you're measuring it over. Obviously, if you leave the solution longer, uh, you're probably going to get a larger temperature change. And you need to control the amount of the reagent to make sure you have a fair practical. Now you could also go and look at the accuracy of this experiment. You can make this practical more accurate by changing this thermometer. This is uh, called an analog thermometer um, and it works on a liquid moving up or down based on the temperature of the solution. However, these aren't that accurate. They can only tell you the temperature either plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees C. That's the resolution on these thermometers. You can make it a lot more accurate by using a digital thermometer that tells you the temperature uh, to the nearest plus or minus 0 0.1 degrees C. To make your results reliable, what you could do is make sure you take lots and lots of readings for this test. We are now on to physics. Well done if you are still sticking with it. We are looking at physics now, and this is the first required practical on the physics uh, syllabus, so this is specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity comes up in this topic quite a bit, and it can be summarized basically with one key equation. And that equation is E equals mc delta theta, where m is mass, c is your specific heat capacity, and delta theta is your change in temperature. And E is, of course, your energy. Now, in this practical, what you're doing is you're going to be calculating the specific heat capacity of different metal blocks. And what you should find is that different metals uh, require different amounts of energy to heat up by the same amount and therefore have different specific heat capacities. Now, to work out the energy supplied to your circuit, because this here is a heater, 
and obviously here you have your thermometer remember to make it more accurate you could just add a digital thermometer so that's something that you could be asked to work out the energy supplied by the heater what you can do is first you can calculate the power of your supply uh, and the power is equal to the voltage times by the current and then the energy supplied equals the power times the time that the appliance is on for. Then to work out the specific heat capacity, what you could do is draw a graph of energy versus change in temperature, where energy will be on the x-axis and the change in temperature will be on the y-axis. And what you should see is you get a straight line and then to work out uh, the specific heat capacity all you'd need to do is calculate the gradient of this graph and that will give you the gradient will give you the specific heat capacity times by the mass so you could divide by the mass or you could just make sure that you use a one kilogram uh, metal block now, some ways that you can make uh, this experimental setup a little bit better is making sure you don't lose any heat to the surroundings. So you can see that here you have an insulating material around the outside, and that is for uh, the fact that we don't want any heat to escape or any heat to enter. So we've put an insulating material around it, and this will mean that the heat stays inside and we'll get a more accurate value for our specific heat capacity. The next physics required practical is calculating the resistance of wire. Now, you can see that different factors affect the resistance of the wire and they are the length of your wire will change the resistance. The thickness of your wire will change the resistance. Or the type of wire will change your resistance. And you could be asked to plan a practical to investigate either three of these independent variables. But your dependent variable is always going to be the same in this practical. And that is going to be the resistance of your wire. Now to calculate the resistance of the wire, you could use an experimental setup like this. We have here our ammeter, which is measuring the current, our voltmeter, which is measuring the voltage. And to calculate resistance, we just use Ohm's law, which equals resistance equals voltage divided by current. Down here, I'm showing a practical in which I am at changing the length of the wire using crocodile clips. So this investigation would be investigating how the length of the wire changes resistance. Now, if I'm doing this, I need to control all of the other variables that will affect my resistance. So I need to keep my type of wire the same. I need to also keep my thickness the same. But one thing that we haven't mentioned is the temperature, which can affect our resistance. And that's something that I can't really control for this practical. This wire is going to get really hot as, um, as uh, the practical goes on because resistance causes heat. And the higher the temperature, uh, the more resistance you're going to have in your wire. So that can affect your practical and your results. And often in the question, this is what comes up. So make sure if you see a resistance of the wire practical, start thinking, ah, they might ask me about the temperature of my wire. Next here, we have the practical, which looks at the component characteristics. In this practical, we investigate three different components. We investigate our resistor, a filament bulb, and also a diode. Now, in this practical, what you want to do is you want to investigate the current and voltage going through your appliance. And then what you need to do is draw a graph showing how the voltage and current 
varies. What you can do to change the voltage and current is either increase the voltage and current by changing the voltage and current on a power pack or either by using a variable resistor in your circuit and that will obviously change the voltage and current going through your appliance. Now looking at the voltage and current going through a resistor you will notice you get a completely straight line going through. And always on my x-axis for these graphs, I have voltage and then I have current going up on my y-axis. For a filament bulb, the graph looks like this because as uh, the bulb is left on for longer, the temperature increases inside that bulb and therefore it starts to flatten out because the higher the voltage, the higher the resistance and it gets hot. And then for a diode, what you observe is because current can only flow in one direction, you will only get a positive line uh, and it will only flow over a certain voltage. Things that it could ask you about the components characteristic practical is the practical setup. So I would make sure that you get this down uh, where here is the component that's being investigated. You can just change that with the symbols. So for obviously for a resistor, it would look like that. For a filament bulb, it's a cross. And for a diode, it is a triangle pointing in the way that that electricity is flowing. The next required practical comes up in the topic of P6, which is molecules and matter. And this practical involves calculating the density of irregular objects. The first thing to remember is the density equation and density is equal to mass divided by volume. Now you can find the mass of your irregular objects quite easily. You can find out the mass by just using a measuring balance and this should tell you your mass in kilograms. Now once you've found your mass in kilograms you need to find out the volume of your irregular object and that is where it becomes a little bit more tricky. You can't just conventionally use your length times width times height uh, for your 3D shape because of the fact it's irregular. So you need to find a different method. Now if your material is more dense than water you can use something called a displacement can and what you need to do is fill that displacement can full of water and place underneath a measuring cylinder. Now, this is called Archimedes principle. When you place your irregular object inside that displacement can, it will displace water and the volume of that water will equal the volume of that object. And that's called Archimedes principle. And that just basically states the volume of water is equal to the volume of object. Now this only works for objects that are more dense than water. If your object is less dense than water, it will float and it will not displace the water. So that's something that you need to remember when discussing this practical. Well done for making it all the way to the end of the video. This is the last required practical and this is looking at the penetrating power of different radioactive sources. Now you can identify which radioactive source you have by looking at what objects will stop it. For example, this alpha radiation gets stopped by even paper. It will in fact only travel a few centimeters in the air. Beta radiation, however, will go straight through paper, but could get stopped by a material such as aluminium. Then you've got gamma radiation, which is by far the most penetrating, and that will only get stopped by thick lead. It will actually travel through some types of thin lead. But what do you do to detect whether it is going through? Well, you use a machine called a Geiger counter. And a Geiger counter works by ionizing particles when it hits the detector. But what you need to remember with this practical is you need to make sure you take a background reading of radiation. This is what they usually ask you about. Um, 
And the reason why you must take a background re reading is because there is radiation in the background uh, from different sources. Uh, it could be radon gas in the atmosphere. It could be uh, from medical equipment or nuclear power stations. Uh, there is al already some background radiation. So you need to take a background reading so you know how much to take away from the Geiger counter to see whether any of your radioactive source has passed through that material. Now well done for watching the video on every single required practical that can come up in paper one. You have done absolutely wicked getting to the end of the video so give yourself a bit of a pat on the back. Uh, remember if you did enjoy the video please drop it a like and if you haven't already subscribe to the channel.